what would be the highlights of the SEO summit in your opinion? I thought it was a lot of business being done, uh, but I, I wouldn't say that there was anything peculiar or uh, interesting going on. Um, I, I didn't pay very close attention to it uh, because things seem to be running smoothly. Uh, Belarus seems to be accepted and uh, things are going well with it. And uh, it seems that uh, the security foundations of Eurasia are coming together. Basically, we have two nuclear tips tipped to it now. Uh, one is Belarus, nuclear uh, Belarus, and the other one is nuclear North Korea. And that pretty much covers the whole continent, except for this little peninsula jutting off into North Sea, uh, called uh, Western Europe. But we can ignore it for now. The thing to understand about about Turkey is that uh, it's it's a very wily participant and w and will always pursue its own ends and everybody knows that by now that it's it's wily and tricky and and fickle in a way uh, but uh, I think that uh, uh, Turkey just like everybody else understands that uh, the old security model based on NATO is gone it's finished. And so Turkey has to have uh, a part in formulating a new security model because if it doesn't, then it will be left with nothing. And um, it seems that there is recognition of that uh, in the fact that Turkey is now pursuing uh, better relations with Syria and, and trying to shore things up on that end, which is a, a great development, very good for Syria. Um, and uh, I, I don't think the relationship with Russia uh, was uh, uh, by any means damaged. I think it's it's going as 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 well as could be expected. So it's it's pretty much just business as usual and, and Turks being Turks. Uh, they're they're not trying to be part of BRICS and SCO. They're they're full fledged members of well uh, BRICS maybe not entirely, but SCO they've been participating, and uh, that's perfectly. You know, it's, it can be explained. Uh, uh, the United States to Turkey at this point is, is a frenemy. It is a detested partner. Turks hate the United States. And, and no Turkish leader can ignore that fact. And also, Turkey has done extremely well because of the Western sanctions. It has provided Russia with uh, uh, a, a way to circumvent these these. Uh, these sanctions, and it wants to keep that going. Now, Russia is, is playing hard to get because it, it doesn't have to use Turkey. It can use any any number of other uh, conduits to get whatever it wants in spite of the sanctions. But Turkey did a, you know, a good run of business that way for a while. Uh, its trade with Russia suddenly ballooned for a short, in a short period of time. And I'm sure that the Turks love that. So the Turks really want two things. One is they don't want those sanctions lifted. And two, they don't want any uh, extensions of those sanctions that would allow, that would prevent Turkey from circumventing them. When you look at the Modi's visit to Russia, Poon said that in the last year, the trade between India and Russia has increased more than 60 percent and and Modi at the same time was talking about deepening the relationship between Russia and India how do you find it right now the, the current state of the relationship between Russia and India and how deep is going to be in your opinion in two years I think it would be about the same I mean it, it's stable uh, the, the issues that they had to resolve was uh, the fact that uh, India became the uh, refiner and transshipment point for uh, Russian crude, which was under sanctions, which was uh, a good deal for everyone. Russia is making more money from its oil exports than ever before. Um, it is using that money to uh, finance all kinds of uh, national development projects uh, in spite of very high interest rates, which are keeping inflation under control, 
it is able to use its budget. And a lot of its budget is filled using oil revenues, thanks to India. So um, uh, Russian oil touches Indian soil and stops being Russian oil and it's no longer under sanctions. Okay? But there is a problem, which is an accumulation of rupees that in, in Russia's accounts. And that's the problem that they were sorting out. And one of the ways to do it would be to uh, use this uh, pseudo cryptocurrency exchange system, except these are uh, cryptocurrencies coined by, by, uh, uh, by national banks. Um, and, and to so sort out issues that way. And there are also a, a lot of other tangential issues, how the two countries can expand their trade in other areas, uh, et cetera. But more than anything, it was just the, um, uh, you know, a courtesy call. Now a Eurasian leader, when elected, uh, goes to Moscow. That is a becoming a traditional thing, uh, a polite gesture. And, uh, so there was, there was some of that as well. Yeah. And when you look at the SCO, do you think that the SCO can become the basis for building a new security architecture in Eurasia? Well, it already is the new architecture, security architecture in, in Eurasia. And it's uh, sort of being very polite about supplanting the UN. Um, but if, if you notice, Gutierrez was present at the SCO summit and said nice things. So he doesn't want to completely be out of the loop, but he understands that, uh, that uh, the United Nations, as it stands, is very much hampered by its American residency. And he doesn't want to uh, completely lose all of his influence and all of the influence of his organization. But it's an old organization. It has done some good things, but it is generally um, too obedient when it comes to the White House and the State Department. And that is a problem for everyone because there's this one country in the world that feels like it's above the law and can do whatever it wants. And the rest of the world has really has had it with it and wants to be wants to put some distance between itself and this and this entity across the ocean. So the SEO is doing that and the UN is uh, being very understanding uh, that, you know, this is happening and this is unavoidable. When you look at Orban and the way that he was trying to bring Russia and Ukraine together to have some sort of negotiations, he offered both to Russia and Ukraine a ceasefire which was, which was rejected by both and but we can appreciate the way that he's trying to do something in the European Union because no no one else is able to do that but Orban because he has good relationship with Putin and he can talk with Zelensky as well and right now he's in China and he's 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 going to he he's visiting China do you understand what's the plan on the part of Orban, what he's trying to do as the new leadership of Europe? Yes, he wants to be a, a, a European politician because there aren't any. If you notice, there are no European politicians left except uh, him and Fizzo. And, um, and so he is using uh, the fact that he... Uh, as the chairmanship of uh, of the European Commission for um, uh, for half a year for six months, is using that to elevate his stature. Now, uh, what Zelensky wants is completely irrelevant because it's not what Putin said is required. So that's just a waste of time to listen to. But you know, out of courtesy, he did go to Kiev because uh, you know why not. Uh, the important thing is that he went to to Moscow and he went to Beijing and was received. And that elevates his stature as a European politician. He's the only European politician that uh, uh, these uh, two major superpowers will now talk to. And uh, 
the rest of the rest of them, the rest of the crew in Brussels is just pretty much being being ignored uh, as they very much deserve. And the other thing that Orban is doing that is uh, quite spectacular is that he uses the word peace. Now, that is completely unacceptable to Brussels. Brussels and NATO do not want peace. They need war because that's what Biden told them. Biden wants a military victory in order to get reelected. Can you imagine the level of idiocy of this person and the level of idiocy of these Eurocrats because they're taking him at his word and acting as if that is something that can be done. They're not really using their brains at all. And, and, um, and Orban is, is calling attention to that fact. We have to get to that point that Europe, together with Russia, consider a new plan for their security in that region. And do you think this Eurasian security architecture would affect that deal that would come to Russia and the European Union? Well, look, I think uh, the, these are fancy words, security, architecture, etc. There's a problem with the Ukraine, which is that it's getting getting weapons from the West. Russia is learning to destroy them before they're used. Uh, they, they just destroyed uh, a couple of billion dollars worth of Patriot uh, batteries, uh, together with 35 American crew members, because the Ukrainians don't know how to run Patriot batteries. Um, so the Russians are getting good at that, but the real solution is to stop those weapons from coming into the Ukraine, and then the war will be over. So it's really as simple as that, and it'll happen one way or another. Uh, right now, there's this idiotic standoff where Russia said, you're hitting our territory, we have to establish a buffer zone wide enough that uh, you can't hit our territory, to which the Americans responded, oh, well, then we'll provide even longer range weapons so that we can still hit your territory. Well, you know where that ends. Uh, you, you basically have Russians destroy the places where those weapons are made. And not really taking responsibility for it, it's just that there will be a lot of factories in the United States and other places kind of going up in smoke or exploding. That's been happening already anyway. And also, they'll get very good at destroying those weapons as soon as they touch Ukrainian territory, not wait for them to be in position and, and discovered later. Because uh, intelligence coming from the Ukrainians themselves, who are sick and tired of, of, uh, of this uh, regime in Kiev, is, is quite good. And the moment something comes into the country, uh, there's a, a, a message that's sent to the right people in Russia. And sometimes they can uh, send off a volley of rockets pretty much, you know, the next minute. Um, they're ready for it. So it's all kind of, uh, it's not about security arrangements. It's about winning the war. There's a war with NATO between Russia and NATO. Russia is going to win it. And that's all that anybody really needs to understand. The rest is just of puffery words. Do you find any sort of hope in this new movement in Europe to do anything considering Ukraine? None at all. None at all. These people do not make decisions that would affect uh, how that goes. Washington tells them to send weapons to Ukraine. They, they uh, posture to pretend that they're actually making a decision, but the decision isn't theirs. If they're told to send weapons, they send weapons. Problem is that they're out of weapons. So the way it's going to end is the Ukraine is going to run out of weapons. Whether the, the, the Europeans want to send lots more weapons or, or not, uh, they will do as they're told until they can. In this new summit of NATO, they're talking about us, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, South Korea. It seems that they're preparing everything to fight China as well. How do you find it? Stoltenberg was talking about this, that China is totally in, in this conflict in Ukraine. They're helping Russia. They're doing everything for Russia. 
do you, how do you find this new attitude of NATO, what they're going to do with China? It's the same old NATO, uh, attitude. NATO is a thing that grows. It's, a, it's like a tumor. It, it constantly has to get bigger or it uh, uh, feels, uh, starts to feel ill. Its bureaucracy uh, is geared to expansion. Now, it, it was planning to expand into the Ukraine. That turns out to be too hot. It uh, tried to expand into Georgia. Um, that didn't work out so well. So now the State Department is, is uh, planning to uh, have some kind of a color revolution as George in Georgia, except the Georgians at this point know who their friends are and, and are likely to be quite resistant to that. So no NATO expansion into Georgia either. Uh, and they now they have these stupid dreams of uh, expanding NATO into uh, Armenia. Well, you know that that's just sort of like um, um, expanding NATO into uh, the Outer Hebrides or something. As as far as the the impact, uh, we all know how well the Ukrainian, uh, I mean the the Armenians fight. You know they 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 didn't put up any sort of a fight at all. They just surrendered all their territory to the, to Azerbaijan in, in recent conflict. So they're 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 not they're not a gift to anyone. But it's something, you know, it's like the beggars can't be choosers. Uh same thing with uh with Australia, New Zealand, South Korea and uh and Japan. If you look at South Korea and Japan, their long term prognosis is death. Uh, the the average birth rate per woman in in South Korea is point uh, uh, three children per woman. Okay, what that means is that with each following generation, you have uh, two thirds fewer South Koreans. So who are you going to draft to fight China? That that's just a you know a ridiculous uh, ridiculous thing to even think about. And and Japan is not not that different. Uh, it it lost to Russia, the fourth place, and as the fourth largest economy in the world, just a couple of years ago. It's going to continue shrinking because it's shrinking in population. It's aging. Uh, it's uh, it's bred a, a whole cohort of young people who don't want to leave their bedrooms. That's a new thing there. Okay, so. Yeah, NATO, go ahead, expand into those countries. Please, please, just blow all your money on, on those hopeless countries that are of, of no military use to anyone. Yeah. Dimitri, did you saw that there is a new article in The Lancet, a high rank medical journal? They're talking about that casualties in Palestine was something even at least a hundred and eighty six thousand and it's unbelievable it's eight nine percent of the population in gaza and i i saw that if it reaches ten percent then that's the uh uh that's where the uh alarm bell goes off for genocide at that point it's undisputably genocide by uh by world standards and uh the israeli government is now you know, a criminal uh, government that nobody has the right to have relations with by international law. They become a pariah state. So they're 0.1% of the Palestinian population away from being an official pariah state. And no amount of effort from, from the White House or the U.S. State Department is, is going to whitewash that fact. Israel is finished. Yeah. Do you think that Netanyahu is still trying to attack Hezbollah or he just decided not to do that? Because it doesn't seem that it would work for him in terms of they're not going they're not going to win. They didn't win. I don't think winning is even in, in part of the, the thought process. Uh, I think uh, he's stalling because he's realized that it's a no win situation if he doesn't start. Uh, a wider war than he's finished. And if he does start a wider war, it's not a question of winning. It's a question of losing very, very badly and rather quickly and suddenly, in which case he's finished. 
So he's stalling for time and, and discussing this and that, but you know, he's, he's really done as a politician. Uh, it's just a matter of time. He's dragging it out as, as much as possible. It's, you know, every day out of jail is a nice day. How do you see the changes that are happening due to this conflict in Gaza, in the Middle East? Well, they, they can't very well be friends with Israel, but not being friends with Israel is not that potent. You know, it's not, it's not that, uh, it's not that effective. Uh, there's a big difference between, um, uh, you know, saying the right things to the right people and um uh, actually doing anything about it and uh what uh what arab countries generally do is talk a lot and do as little as possible uh that is you, you might say that's their mode and i don't think they've gotten out of their mode yet i don't think that they're uh anywhere near uh the point where they would join forces for instance uh Uh, have a, a joint military command. Um, you know, that's just not happening. And um, I, I don't think it's it, it will happen uh, anytime soon. It also has to be understood that nobody really likes the Palestinians in the Arab, uh, in the Arab world. Um, the, uh, the Iranians have connections there, but for a different set of reasons. For a strategic set of reasons, uh, whereas the rest of the world just deals with the Palestinian issue as um, a sort of hot potato that nobody really wants to do anything about. Uh, there's nobody in Washington to work with. I mean, the United States doesn't have a president and hasn't had one for three years. Um, you know, it, it, everybody now suddenly realizes that uh, uh, Joe Biden is a mushroom. But and he can't be president for another four years. Can he be president right now? Could he have been president a year ago? And and so when you talk about doing business with the United States, everybody is in shock and horror at at what has happened. Uh, this rudderless country, run by uh, a, a a maniacal, old, angry old man, who will only listen to things he, he wants to hear and has a completely uh, uh, deranged picture of the world in his head. So, of course, everybody is going to try to run away as quickly as possible. I don't think that that has anything to do with Palestine, particularly. I think it has to do with just the fact that the United States is, is, uh, is, is going away as a country. If Trump wins... How fast he can solve the situation as he claims that he's going to put an end to the conflict in Ukraine in 24 hours. With the current phase of the conflict, with the complications, with the a lot of things to take into account right now in Ukraine, do you think is that possible? Okay, so uh, he rolls into office and he says... Russians, you will do this, that, and the other thing, and then we promise that we'll, we'll do X. And the Russians say, what good is your promise? You've lied to us so many times that we no longer believe you. you and you didn't just lie to us. You've lied to everyone, and you lied during your campaign, and you're just a liar. So you think you're a president of a great country, but we think you're a liar. Go away. And that would be pretty much the end of it. Um, it, it might get broken down to... We would consider not sending uh, uh, any more long-range weapons to the Ukraine if you blah, blah, blah. And, and the Russians say, well, that would be against our constitution. Goodbye. And, and so it'll go back to the mode where the Ukraine will run out of people and will run out of weapons and will crash. The end. And it has nothing to do with Donald Trump. And as, as far as who is going to run on the Democratic side, I think it should be a yellow dog. Um, you know, there's an expression, the yellow dog Democrats, uh, who will vote for the Democrat, even if it's a yellow dog. Now, in fact, there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that pre prevents uh, a dog from running for the presidency. Unfortunately, it's uh, 
it, dogs don't get old enough, but if you calculate it in dog years, which is, there's every reason to do, then, um, you know, a slightly elderly yellow dog would do just fine and, and uh, would either win or lose. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter who the president of the United States is. Look, the country has been bumbling along for three and some years without a president or with a president who's completely deranged, who, who is not fit to hold an office job, never mind be a president. And, you know, the country is falling apart just like it would on any, anyway. So whatever happens, it's all good. How about the conflict between China and the United States? What would that mean for the conflict in Taiwan? Do you think that Donald Trump would even bring more tensions to the conflict? Ah, uh, tensions, yes, of course. Everybody will get very tense and, and then will get slightly relaxed a little while later. But war? Uh, you know how many spare parts the U.S. military uses that come from China that can't be sourced from anywhere else? You know how long the U.S. military can function without those imports from China? China is already putting the screws to the United States uh, in in lots of ways um, uh, uh, as far as uh, exports of uh, key materials for for a, a number of things. If, you know, if, if the if the U.S. wants to play it hard, it'll be deprived of uh, uh, what industry it has left, what high tech it has left, because it, it just won't get the parts it needs or the supplies. And and so there there's a lot of posturing going on. And again, you know, there's this uh, power hungry organization called NATO, and there's the Pentagon and the defense contractors. And it's the defense contractors at this point that really don't want to hear the word peace. If there's one word that just completely just, you know, ends the conversation, it's the big uh, uh, defense contractors in the United States. They don't want peace. They want war. But they don't want actual war because that would be a defeat. Because a, a, a war at this point is a defeat. So they want to talk about war, they want to prepare for war, but they don't want to fight a war. And so to prepare for war, you need to simulate tensions. But it doesn't mean that an actual war will erupt, you know, far from it. Uh, I think that basically it'll uh, just mean the United States running out of money and crashing. What's the necessity of having the China's army, a part of the China's army in Belarus? What's what's the message, in your opinion, from Russia, China, and Belarus to the West? Oh, it's just symmetry. So the Russians went to North Korea and the Chinese went to Belarus. And if you look at Belarus and North Korea, um, other than the fact that uh, the North Koreans are Korean and the, um, uh, the Belarusians are Russian, Belo, um, there isn't there isn't really that that big a difference between them, um, and and so this is symmetry. This is basically um, saying to the world, we own this continent, all of it. On China, there is a new report that shows China supplies forty percent of all semiconductors needed for the production of key weapon system in. To the United States defense industry, how they can just compensate this if something happens between China and the United States? They can't. Look, they they allocated billions of dollars to building a semiconductor factory in Arizona, and they made a bunch of uh, um, uh, PowerPoint presentations, had some fancy luncheons that everybody flew to to talk about this and that. I think they platted a piece of ground, so it's flat now. And that's it. Money gone. So now they have to start over. And that's sort of uh, what what the United States is like these days. Because, you see, in China, if somebody screws up, you, you they're gone. They, they may actually get shot if it's an official who screws up significantly. 
in the United States, if somebody screws up, you aren't allowed to tell them because it'll make them feel bad. It'll cause them a psychological problem, and that's illegal. So the Americans are not up to doing much. That's that's my conclusion. They're they're very upset when you use the wrong pronoun. Never mind stealing the money for an entire factory. You know that that's that, that that's less important than using the right pronoun. The, the question is, what would be the solution for the United States? Just moving the business to India, to the United States, to some other countries? How do you see that? Is that possible for them to shift from China to India, for example? It's not that easy to do that. Mm, no, it's not easy. It takes a long time and it's it takes skilled labor. And that skilled labor is Chinese. And the Chinese are understanding that, well, you might go to the United States for a while, but is it really a country that you want to have uh, a close relationship with over a long period of time? Um, these days, the Chinese prefer to get their degrees in the United States, maybe, where a lot of the professors at this point are Chinese too, and then go back to China. Um and and uh, I don't think that the United States at this point is attractive enough for anyone to to actually go there and and do do the work that the Americans are no longer capable of doing because they are very much about you know eating lunch and 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 playing with PowerPoint presentations. Just to wrap up this session, Dimitri, do you think that how do you see the future of the eastern part of Europe and the western part of Europe? If the eastern part of Europe gets closer to Russia and China, in 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 gets closer to BRICS, and how do you see the future of these two parts of Europe? Well, I, I don't think. Um, well, China might claim you know a little country or two in Eastern Europe, but I don't think Russia is interested. Uh, the Russians have really had it with the Eastern Europeans uh, when they were part of the, the Warsaw Pact. Uh, they, they were unruly and they are now ungrateful and there is no reason to, uh, to expect them to, to change their ways. When, when things go bad, they will come begging for Russians to feed them and when things improve, they will uh, insult Russians to their face and tell them to go away. Russia has had enough of that. I don't think it, that's going to happen anymore. 